Lewis from Chicago, an attorney uh, in high school, member of a four-member jazz combo, right? This is true. What instrument were you playing? I played the bass guitar. I still play occasionally, but at the time, uh, we were told to get out and hone our skills and do gigs in the community, so we played a Hey, that's a pretty good building, 25 bucks. For... I was happy to have it. Yes, indeed. Good for you. Alex Schmidt, writer and comedian from Pasadena. What's this about when you were much younger, you helped overthrow an evil lord? Where? So I was at Bristol, Wisconsin's Renaissance Fair. Uh -huh. And there's sort of a narrative at any Renaissance Fair, there's usually an evil lord doing something bad. And they were asking people in the crowd to do an impression of the evil lord that would make him feel bad. Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, is also known as this Canis Majoris. Also known as Alpha Canis Majoris. Back to you, Alex. Book by its cover for two. This beloved children's novel has twice been adapted for the big screen. Greg, what is Charlotte's Web? You got it. Yeah. Uh, book for four. Secrets and conspiracies play out in this 2003 thriller graced by the eyes of the Mona Lisa. What is that? Uh, Alex, what is it, the Vigico? Yes. Book for six. In China, it was used to popularize an ideology among the masses. Alex, yeah, what is the Little Red Book? The Little Red Book. Quotations from Chairman Mao. Correct. Book for eight. Ruling over a 1990 Crichton book cover is a large, scary skeleton of one of these. Jen. What is the Tyrannosaurus Rex? Yes. Uh, Cosmic best-selling non-fiction from 1988, whose cover featured its author in a wheelchair. Damn. Alex, what is a brief history of time? Yes. Stephen King in a wheelchair. Great letter. Here, rest in peace. Stretching from Guangzhou to Macau is China's Pearl River. This. Jen, what is a delta? That's a Greek letter. Uh, I'll be Christiana on the board for 200. Okay. My new PBS program, Unemployed Company, features one-on-one -on -one interviews like those I conducted during the Arab Spring with Egypt's Hosni Mubarak and this soon to be ex-Libyan leader. Alex, who is Gaddafi? Muammar Gaddafi. Right. Uh, I'm on board for four. My 2006 oh, year of all the parents gone focused on Kenyan children orphaned by this disease. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is AIDS? Yes. Uh, Christiane, first uh, Yeah. In a case of art imitating life, my journalism career was an inspiration to the character Rory, and we got to meet in person in the finale of this TV series. Alex, what is Gilmore Girls? Good. How yeah. for great. During its siege by Serbian forces in the 1990s, I reported from near the front lines of this Bosnian capital. It's Kosovo. Alex? What is Sarajevo? Right. Sarajevo. Four for that. Ah. Following his election victory in 2013, I interviewed this country's president, Hassan Rouhani, and elicited from him a condemnation of the Holocaust. What is Iran? Greg, uh, what is Iran? Iran is the right country, and I do want to thank Christian Hamon for, for sharing some great moments. Hey, that's your that's uncle, Amidou's favorite TV personality, yo. And I used to hear you should hear him it's call. A, it's the mathematical summation symbol seen here. What is epsilon? Alex, what is sigma? Sigma. Right. sigma. Greek letter for six. It's the tenth letter of the Greek alphabet and the third in the name of an honor society founded in 1776. Great. What is kappa? Good. Now the last clue. I have not won this of doubt that you will respond correctly. Iota. Alex, what is Iota? Iota, that's the Greek letter. Yes. You're at an even 10,000. Big lead for you. That was awesome. But yeah, man, between Anthony Bourdain and Chris, 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 yeah, Christiana Amunpo, if I hadn't visited Sierra Leone in 2013, yo, 
I did never knew who Christiana Amapo is. Honest to God, I mean, like she's she's on CNN International all the time, even Anthony Bourdain show. Because like I said, I don't usually watch news on TV here, because I, I don't. Like, I read this book in New York when I lived in New York in 2009, titled The, the More You Watch, The Less You Know, about how news media, how everything is, for, especially with Fox News and everything. So I did not know who they were, but, you know. I digress. Mm. I was hoping to get here a little earlier today, but I had to stay later at work, so. Oh, man. All right, this is from Huffington Post. This was this morning or this afternoon. I, it just came to my phone not too long ago, and it is titled, The Only Republican Who Acted Like a Senator. Lisa Murkowski stepped back from her party in a toxic fight over Brett Kavanaugh to ask a simple question. Where is the public confidence? This was written by Jennifer Bendery. It was updated two hours ago, it says. Mm. And it reads, Washington, somewhere in between a California woman's allegation of attempted rape and a Supreme Court nominee's unhinged behavior in front of a Senate committee, in between the lies and threats and claims of a rigged system, in between the president marking a sexual assault survivor and the throngs of other survivors demanding to be heard outside the Capitol building, Senator Lisa Murkowski, Republican Alaska, took a step back. Her party was plowing ahead with putting Brett Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court, even as he was driving Washington's already toxic environment to a new law. GOP senators were lining up to praise Kavanaugh and dismiss Christine Blasey Ford, who had accused him of sexual assault. But Murkowski was nowhere to be seen. Nobody knew how she planned to vote until the Senate held a vote to, come to advance Kavanaugh's nomination. When her name was called, Murkowski stood up at her desk, looked dead ahead, and said in a barely audible voice, No. Secret. Greg, what is Victoria's Secret? Oh, 
Alex, but is Victoria's Secret Santa? That's it, yes. Before and after. Uh, before and after the Molly Hunt. Bookseller made up of argon, neon, xenon, helium, or radon. Greg, what is Barnes and Noble gases? gases. Yeah. Yep. Barnes and Noble uh, gases. Before and after 1200. The main outdoor clothing company that moonlights as a number cruncher. Jen. What is LLB counter? That's it. Uh, I'll take before and after for 1600. Well, Pedro boxing matches and five Olympiads who is also an upscale department store founded in Dallas, Texas. Oh, is Leroy Neiman Marcus. Jen, back to you. I'll do uh, before and after for 2000. The 20% off coupons an alliterative home store mails out include the lyrics, My lover stands on golden sand. Alex. What is Bed Bath & Beyond the Sea? Good. <laughs> uh, let's do People in Science 800. CN is the symbol for an artificially produced radioactive element named for this astronomer. Who is Copernicus? Great. Who is Copernicus? Correct. Uh, science pure. <laughs> In the 1700s, he developed the first practical mercury thermometer and the temperature scale that bears his name. Who is Mohs? Great. Who is Fahrenheit? He's the one. Ah, yeah. In the hell is that thinking Mohs? In Africa, she made her first big discovery. The partial skull of Who's Diane Fossey? Early humans. Greg, who is good on? No. Diane Fossey. Who is Mary Leakey? Ah. Back to you, Greg. Uh, Facebook perform. Job changed his profile pic after shaving this, not for the Dwayne Johnson look, but in mourning for his ten children. Alex. What is his beard? No. Greg, what is his head? Shaved his head? No. A joke for eight. Throwback Thursday, Joe back in the day with 3,000 of these humped creatures. After his troubles, the Lord blessed him with 6,000. What are camos? Yeah. What are camos? Good. Uh, Facebook of Joe for 1,200. Answer there. There we go. So that's what this clue is worth. Job added a surprised gift when he posted the Lord's info that Behemoth can draw up this river into its mouth. What is it now? Or the Black Sea? What, what is, is it now? Jordan. That's it. Oh. That's the river. Yeah. Um, Don't laugh at me, yeah. I'm trying. I'm trying. During tough times, Job's D.W., this person, urged him to curse God and die. D.W. was his dear wife. Jen? Job for 2000. Private message, Job, if you have a good remedy for sore these skin eruptions, sold to scalp, scraping with a potsherd isn't doing much. Greg, what are boils? Boils, yes. Uh, other constitutions were for Afghanistan. No law shall contravene the tenets and provisions of this faith. What is Islam? Jen. What is Islam? That's right. Less than a minute now. Uh, constitutions for two thousand. Oh, she found both of them. She found both of them. So thinking Ethiopia, yo, but I did not know they were gonna go there with it. I'm having three letters. Alex, what is yen? Crossword eight. In a new town, it's fun to stay here. Four letters. What is it? YMCA. What is YMCA? Pass. Oh, Alex. What is the YMCA? Good. Crossword clue is twelve thousand. I mean twelve hundred. To give away five letters. What is yield? What is yield? That's it. Uh -huh. That's a good category. Please, Jeopardy, don't let that clue be about President Dump Trump. Please. I mean, 
I don't think it's going to be because it will be too, too obvious. The contestants are probably thinking the same thing too, sir. When her name was called, Makowski stood up at her desk, looked dead ahead and said in a barely audible voice, no. In the end, she was the only Republican who did not support Kavanaugh. Her vote did not prevent his, 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 his confirmation. Technically, she voted present on the final vote as a personal gesture for a senator who had to miss the vote. Yeah, that senator is somebody else who needs to, to be getting rid of. I think he's a sen the senator from Wyoming or Montana. He, he was getting married or something around this weekend, so that's why he was absent. The congressional record will reflect that she was a no on the nomination. It was a bold move by Murkowski, and of course, President Donald Trump wasted no time in warning that she would never recover from it politically, which shows how little he knows about her or Alaska politics. And the reasoning behind her vote spotlights her as the only senator in her party who actually acted as the Constitution intended. In a sobering Friday night speech on the Senate floor, Murkowski says she did not vote based on a particular policy issue though she was certainly under pressure to oppose Kavanaugh over abortion rights. She is pro-choice. Health care, she supports preserving the Affordable Care Act. Thank you, Lisa. And tribal protections. Alaska natives strongly oppose Kavanaugh. It wasn't about believing Ford over Kavanaugh either, she said, or the horrible or overtly political process that marked the debate over him and left all involved miserable. Makowski says she voted no on Kavanaugh because she is worried that confirming him after the nasty partisan's fight sparked by his nomination will further erode the already winning choice people have in government. We are at a time when many in this country have lost faith in the executive branch. There is not an executive branch right now. It was stolen with the help of a hostile foreign power. Come on. Like, that branch is non-existent for four years. It is, yeah. Like the Washington Post said, it is democracy in darkness. Darkness has fallen upon us. We are at a time when many in this country have lost faith in the executive branch. And here in Congress, many around the country have just given up on us. They've just completely said we've had enough. Yeah, if you've really had enough, go get, go get this, those crazy ball heads out of town, namely the Republican Party. We got to chase those crazy, chase those crazy ball heads out of the yawn. It's like, now let me stop. But people still have opened the judiciary as an independent, nonpartisan, fair and balanced branch, Murkowski said. It's that hope that I seek to maintain because it is so critical that we have that public confidence in at least one of our three branches of government. When it came to Kavanaugh, she said she looked, she looked to the Code of Judicial Conduct, Rule 1.2. Mandela wasn't locked up. He was locked up in 62. So, yeah, what the fuck is this? Winston Churchill? Greg, we come to you first. You had 6,800. You started slowly and you built up and you came up with Eli Wiesel, and that's incorrect. It will cost you, sir. Eli Wiesel was not in the war leader. She's shaking her head, unable to come up with a response, and she will lose 4,701. She's going to finish. Better not be Mandela. I'll be mad as fuck. I'll be mad as fuck. Did he come up with a correct response, however? He did. Winston Churchill. There you go. There you go. Yeah, Mandela, in 53, Mandela was still trying to bring down apartheid in his government. He wasn't barely unknown around the world, so it had to be the white boy with such a... Atopic dermatitis, you never know how your skin will look. And it can feel like no... All the time. But even though you see and feel your eczema on the surface... How about you? Here's an order. And now Brazier has the seventh. Well, Brazier...
these damn Yankees don't want it for real. The Yankees don't want it. I take it back, Red Sox fans. I'm sorry. I thought the Yankees were gonna beat beat your team, even though yeah, yeah, we're the most superior team, you know. Yeah, that that. When it came to Kavanaugh, she said she looked at the Code of Judicial Conduct, Rule 1.2, which states that a judge must, quote, act at all times in a manner that promotes public confidence in the independence, integrity, and partiality of the judiciary, and shall avoid impropriety and the appearance of impropriety. A judge shall act at all times, not just sometimes when, when you win your vote, in a manner that promotes public confidence, she says. Public confidence. Where is the public confidence? That is simply put where Kavanaugh failed to meet the standard, Murkowski said. Yeah. I, I wish the rest of your, your, of your Republican brethren and sisters and I mean, actually had your, your high level of principled morality. Yeah. She referred to the September 27th. Senate Judiciary hearing, Senate Judiciary Committee hearing, at which Governor flushed with anger at times, weeping at other moments, crocodile tears, blamed the revenge-minded Democrats for besmirching him as he refuted Ford's allegations. It became clear to me, or it was becoming clearer, that that appearance of impropriety has become unavoidable, Murkowski said. I could not conclude he is the right person for the court at this time. You know who is the right person for that court? Gavik Marlin or Merrick Garland. I, mean, I, I, I know, I, I just messed up his name all over, but Merrick Garland, yeah. That's true. Trump isn't the only Republican griping about Murkowski's vote. Alaska GOP party leaders are considering re re reprimanding her for opposing Kavanaugh. The state party chairman told the Associate Press that the leadership may also withdraw its support for Murkowski and ask her not to seek re-election in 2022, yeah, I mean in 2022, as a Republican. And Murkowski's spokeswoman did not respond to a request for comments. Murkowski, though, is no stranger to bucking political norms. She won a re-election battle in, a, in 2010 as a writing candidate after a Tea Party insurgent defeated her in that year's GOP primary. A, a source close to the senator who requested an anonymity to speak freely said her Senate speech seemed to be sending a message to three distinct people. One, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford, I hear you and understand you. Two, Judge Kavanaugh, this is a cerebral branch of government designed to be filled with exceptional seasoned intellects. President Dumchow, the three branches are expected to have standards and behaviors, morals and metabolisms that I deeply believe him. Yeah, I deeply believe him. The source added that Murkowski was arguably taking the, the truly conservative position by voting no on Kavanaugh in an effort to preserve the institutional role of the Senate as the full source that calls T function envisioned by the founders. At least one long-time federal judge caught Murkowski's speech and told Huffington Post that she hit the nail on the head on the topic that many want to ignore. How crucial it is that people have faith in the court. Murkowski's words were reassuring to this judge who requested an, an anonymity to speak freely. It's not what we address, it's how we address it that can either heal or harm, the judge said in an email. Much harm has been done by Kavanaugh's confirmation process. For those of us who care deeply about people, institutions, and decency in debate and disagreement, it is a painful time. I'm one of those people who care about all those things. I know it might not seem as it, but at the same time, though, there's a method to me, there's a method to the madness of the way I'm going about doing this. You know what I mean? I'm just saying. Like Dr. King said, freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressed. It must be demanded by the op freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Yeah. What's that, man?
That was my boy, Leave It or Beaver. See, that's if 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 there are enough votes on Proposition Eight for the dialysis centers having to pay more, and I mean, like that brother right there who I just had a conversation with, he's one of the people I know personally who will be affected by that. You know what I mean? So, like, it ain't nothing but corporate greed by Davida and Phoenicius. Is that how, how, how it's pronounced? But uh, I digress though. Makowski said in her speech that she agonized over her vote but ultimately did what she thought was right. I am really worried about this becoming, uh, I'm, uh, I'm really worried that this becomes the new normal where we find new and even more creative ways to tear one another down, she said. The hateful, the aggressive, the truly, truly awful manner which with, with, which with so many are acting now has got to end. This is not who we are. This is not who we should be. This, this story has been updated to clarify that Murkowski voted present on the vote to confirm Kovner, but that the congressional record will reflect that she was in no vote. Okay, and this was from CNN.com. It says three theories behind Nikki Haley's shocking resignation. Analysis by Chris Siliza, CNN editor at large, and it came through today at about six hours ago. In a political world seemingly incapable of being shocked, the resignation of UN, United Nations Ambassador Nikki Haley on Tuesday did just that. The most common reaction upon hearing the news, which Axios' Jonathan Swan first reported, was, What? A senior State Department official told CNN that Haley had only told her staff about her resignation Tuesday morning. Another source familiar with the matter said Haley's re resignation caught National Security Advisor John Bolton and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo by surprise. And that reaction was quickly followed by why? Right. The answer to the second question is now the big story. And in truth, we just don't totally know, know yet why Haley, who seems to be one of the few Trump administration officials able to stay in the good graces of Trump, the international community, and establishment Republicans all at once. Would, would decide to simply and suddenly call it quits. Trump, seeking to minimize any damage to himself from the surprise res resignation, sat down with his outgoing U.S. ambassador shortly after the news broke and insisted he, A, knew about her plans to leave last week, and B, she had made the decision because she had served for two years, actually one year and seven months, and felt like it was time to go. Yo, that's all. That This motherfucker ain't even been in office two years here, yo. Oh my God. <sighs> and felt that it was time to go. Haley will leave her job at the end of the year. Trump announced Tuesday. It's been eight years of intense times, Haley said of her time as governor of South Carolina and her time in the administration. Yo, Nikki, if it's one thing, I want to thank you for it is the swift handling of 
the racist white boy Dylan Wolf and his killing of the nine people at at Ebenezer Church. You know what I mean? I give you I give you a bit of a credit for that because you 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 were a white female governor of a historically redneck slavery confederacy confederate state. You know what I mean? South Carolina is South Carolina. You know what I mean, your history in the confederacy is probably tops. It's probably close to Mississippi's history and Virginia's history. You know what I mean? So, yeah. But long story short, though, your handling of that whole mess. Bravo. No one could have done a better job at that. You know I mean? It has been eight years of intense times, Haley said of her time as governor of South Carolina and her time in the administration. And, and I am a believer in term limits. You should tell that to your boss. She added, I don't have anything set on where I am going to go. She lying like shit. She about to run for president. And that, might, and that might be true, but the fact that neither Bolton nor Pompeo had any inkling that Haley was preparing to resign cast some doubt on the this was all part of the plan explanation. And losing an Indian American woman four weeks before an election and on the heels of a very contentious Supreme Court fight that divided deeply along gender lines suggests, suggests it's far less than ideal timing for, for a dumb chore. So. What else might be beyond Haley's shock resignations? Here are a few theories. Now, these are theories now by, by the CNN people. Theory number one, she got edged out by the likes of Bolton and Pompeo. It's no secret that the National Security Advisor and Secretary of State, respectively, are foreign policy hardliners. And that while Haley was out, outwardly very tough within the United States and the Trump administration, she was reportedly a voice urging more moderation and towing the preferred line of establishment Republicans in private. Yo, Haley, I'm asking you, man, like Jeff Flake, like I asked Jeff Flake, or like I'm asking Murkowski, forget the fact of the historical ideological slants with the Republican Party that you've been a part of. Come join the Democrats. Come on. Come inject some backbone into that party. Please, you know what I mean? I'm asking you because Republican backbone is much, much stronger and much valuable compared to Democratic backbone. The Democratic Party doesn't have a backbone. If they had a backbone, they would not sit there for eight years and let Republicans make, make, make Obama seem like he wasn't an accomplished president. They could have ran on Obamacare's numbers. They could have ran on the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau numbers. They could have ran on the unemployment numbers. But no, the whole country was all in hopes because of Tea Party movement, because the black man was president. I mean, like, the Democratic Party don't have a backbone. Like, don't. I hate to say, but it's the truth. Everybody knows that. Everybody who's politically inclined in this country knows that for a fact. You know I mean? but while Haley was without question a star of the first year of Trump's administration, she, <coughs> she did clash with him at times over and among, and among other things. Russia. During a television appearance in April, Haley announced the U.S. will impose new sanctions on Russia. Trump insisted no such sanctions had been put in place, and the White House blamed the misunderstanding on a momentary confusion on Haley's part. She quickly responded that she did not get confused. That's why I'm asking you, man. Trump has exposed the Republican Party for what it is. Now, Nikki, you grew up in a racist environment. I get it. You know what it means to be racist. You know it. You know it firsthand. You know what I mean? It's probably in your blood, but you fight it every day. I get it. That's why I'm asking you, man. Like, you see what? And I guarantee you, a lot of his supporters believe that you were confused, even though you know for a fact they know for a fact you were not confused. You know what I mean? I'm just saying. Yeah, I. I you not want to get confused. You're not him. You're smarter than him. You got more sense than him. You've probably read more than I, I've read in, in, in the time he's been president, and I know for a fact I've read more than he's read. You got to read, right? You're the UN ambassador representing the United States. You get material in front of you every day that you have to absorb and digest and analyze, you know. But your boss can't do that. With Bolton and Pompeo as the new shiny objects in, in the Trump cabinet, Haley may have seen the writing on the wall and decided to live on her own terms before she is pushed. 
Theory number two, she needs to make some money. Haley has spent a long time in elected or appointed office. Prior to being elected governor in 2010, she spent six years as a member of the state house. Those are not hugely lucrative jobs. In 2015, the year before she was tapped to serve in the Trump administration, her and her husband reportedly reported an annual income of just over $170,000. In 2014, their number was closer to $190,000. And in 2013, Haley and her husband, Michael, were reported making $270,000. According to, to Haley's 2018 financial disclosure, she reported, she reported a significant number of outstanding debts, including somewhere between $25,000 and $65,000 in, in credit cards, a mortgage in excess of $1 million, and a line of credit between $250,000 and $500,000. With one child in, in, in college and another headed there in the next few years, Haley could well have been lured by the several-figure salaries available to someone with a resume like hers in the in, in the private sector. Also note Watson, over the weekend, Citizens' Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, a government ethic works, work, watchdog, requested an investigation into Ellie's acceptance of seven free flights from South Carolina businessmen in 2017. Theory number three, she wants to run for president. Now everybody's thinking that running for president is, is something you can just do by just saying whatever the fuck comes in your head. You know what I mean? I swear, yo. They had to reduce what it meant to, to become president to what this guy is. You know what I mean? They, they had to reduce it to... Man. There's very little doubt that Haley has an eye on the White House at some point in the future. Doubt me. Haley bought her own. Haley bought her most trusted political advisor and poster, John Lerner, to the UN with her, knowing that her resignation would set off talks of a potential primary challenge to Trump in 2020. Haley laughed off the, the, the possibility during her comments on Tuesday, making clear her plans to campaign for Trump in two years' time. In truth, Haley is too smart to run against Trump in 2020. While Trump's approval ratings are in bad shape with the broad electorate. He is among the most popular Republican president ever among Republican voters. God, you know what? No explanation needed. I've been hopping on that this whole time. No one is building Trump in a primary in 2020. Not Haley, not anyone. But just because Haley isn't running in 2020 doesn't mean she isn't running. Remember that whether Trump wins or loses in 2020, the 2014 Republican nomination will be open. Yes. Vice President Mike Pence is a likely candidate, particularly if Trump wins his second term in 2020. Yo, yeah, okay. I, I got to keep hopping on this a little bit more. Black and brown America, yo, please, man. Black America is 50 million strong. Brown America is about, about 65 million strong. You know what I mean? That's about 100 and some million strong. And we have about let's say about 70 or so million good-hearted white folks in this country who knows that they will love nothing more than to not see another Trump presidency, a Mike Pence presidency, or a Nikki Haley presidency, or any Republican presidency that is, for the next half, for the next 50 years, for the next generation. You know what I mean? I'm just saying, they are out there. So I'm asking y'all, man, just so we wouldn't have a potential vice, a potential president Mike Pence at any point in American history. Please, man, let let this fucker be the last Republican president for the next 50 years, yo. Let him be the last Republican president for the next 50 years. Because if he's the last Republican president for the next 50 years, that generational, that millennial, that generational disenfranchisement, that generational separation of the haves and the have-nots that's been going on for so long can be reduced over the next 50 years. That is important. If you want to if you want to tell somebody that black lives matter, go do that. Make sure you do that every year for the next 50 years, y'all. Make sure. If you're 18 right now, that means from now till you're 68. 
That is 50 ballots every year in your community. Like, make sure that things like this don't happen again. Make sure this fucking guy doesn't, someone like him doesn't sit in their, in their office again. Someone like him is not in charge of the executive branch of a branch of government. Someone like Mike Pence is not in a position to transverse two branches of government and have tie-breaking votes that can roll back regulations that are good for people who are poor and broke in America. You know what I mean? I'm just saying. So, back to what I was saying, though. In truth, Haley is too smart to run against Trump in 2020. While Trump's approval ratings are in bad shape with the broad electorate, he is among the most popular Republican presidents ever among Republican voters. No one is beating him in the primary in 2020, not Haley, not anyone. But just because, okay, that means that no one on the Republican side is going to beat him. That doesn't mean that somebody on the Democratic side should have beat him, just like Hillary beat him two years ago, but you know. The electoral college people did not go out and vote a lot of people if you sit there thinking i'm coming i'm coming for you for no fucking reason think about it you remember in 2015 2016 well yeah i was about oh i want to be voting like that's what happened but just because Haley isn't running in 2020 doesn't mean she isn't running remember that whether trump wins or loses in 2020 the 2024 republican nomination will be open Yes, Vice President Mike Pence is a likely candidate, particularly if Trump wins a second term in 2020. Please, yo, we can't have that. We cannot have that, yo. Like, all right, put it this way. Two years from now, if this fucking guy wins the election, right? It's cool. Mass will be back in the motherland. Because he, he, he's sure as shit. Gonna make sure my ass get deported. You know what I mean? I'm not mad at it. I'm not like. I've made my bones with that. I'm good. You know what I mean? Like, I'm good with that. We'll talk. So, yeah, but please, man, don't let this guy win another time. First of all, he had done, he, he has done a bunch of things already that's gonna make sure that the odds are in his favor. Something like trying to put a citizenship question on the census. Yeah. You might be thinking right now why they shouldn't put a citizenship question because the United States, the nation that it is, the census wants to know how many people live in the country, not how many people are citizens. Well, you know how many people, because as so soon as you ask that citizenship question, you come to a place like, let's say, you go to uh, San Jose or you go to El Paso, Texas. El Paso might have a population of, let's say, 100,000 people, let's say, hypothetically. But of that 100,000 people, let's say it's only about 20,000 that are white and citizens in America. Of that remaining 8,000, let's say the rest of that is a mix between black and brown. Let's say of that 80,000, only 20,000 are green card holders. That means they're not citizens. Okay? Now we have an extra 60,000 that's black and brown citizens of the United States. Okay, that's fine and dandy. If you go ask the citizenship question to all those people, that means that there's gonna be, there's gonna be less money for El Paso because the census counted 20,000 people less. Does that make sense? You know what I mean? Like, I know Dump Trump and, and his administration is trying to make it seem like it's an American thing, it's a nationalistic thing, but it's really not. They're trying to fool people, they're trying to fool people who don't know better about that shit. I've admitted I'm not a US citizen, I've never voted. I'm not looking forward to voting in this country because nine times I'd say my ass will get deported anyway. You know what I mean? So I'm not tripping about that. I'm asking you who can to do that though. Put it this way. Him trying to make it seem like it's a national security thing, it's an American thing against somebody like me who speaks with an accent, who's trying to say it's not really. It's the whole divide and conquer of the white supremacy playbook. You know what I mean? The citizenship question is now required on the census. It's not. The citizenship question is required where you go try to like run for Senate, run for president, you know what I mean? Try to like maybe, uh, like what? Even joining the army. 
Don't even ask you if you're a citizen joining the army. All you gotta do, all you gotta be is legal in this country. I was a green card holder when I was in basic training at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Yes, relax in Jackson. Bravo, company. Bravo, bulldog. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. In your U.S. Army, as a green card holder. Just saying. But I digress, though. Yes, Mike, Vice President Mike Pence is a likely candidate, particularly if Trump wins a second term in 2020. And he will be the Trump candidate. But what if there is a desire for a candidate who has okay relations with Trump wall, but also is not seen as totally and completely aligned with a former president who was, to put it mildly, a non-traditional Republican candidate and president? Enter Haley. She will have spent almost two years serving Trump, yes, but by the time 2024 comes around, she will be six years removed from the Trump White House, which might be a very appealing thing to Republicans. Yeah, I don't know about that. Oh, speaking of my boy Kavanaugh, what up, Brett? <laughs> ah, what up, Brett? Uh, this just came through like a couple of hours ago. I actually saw this when I was getting off the bus on my way home, trying to come catch Jeopardy. I knew that I was going to miss like the first 10 minutes or for five minutes. This was from NBCNews.com. It is the election section. Kavanaugh asks plenty of questions during arguments on four Supreme Court cases. The court's newest member chatted occasionally with Justice Elena Kagan, who sits next to him on the bench. This was by, by Pete Williams, by the way. Oh, they got Kavanaugh near the American flag. <laughs> Brett Kavanaugh took a seat on the U.S. Supreme Court bench just after 10 a.m. on Tuesday and participated fully as he cut hard two cases about the kind of crimes that can trigger long prison sentences under a federal law intended to get repeat offenders off the street. The court was the same. I'm, I'm trying to see if the Yankees are making a comeback here. Yeah. Trying to see if they're mounting a comeback. I, I know it looks like it's over, but can't give up on my boys here, man. Can't give up on them boys like that. Oh, they got Chris Sale in the eighth inning? That's not fair, y'all. Oh, Alex Cole, that's not fair, y'all. But I get it, though. This is for all the marbles, so I get it, okay. Brett Kavanaugh took his seat on the Supreme Court bench just after 10 a.m. on Tuesday and participated fully as he caught her two cases about the kind of crimes that can trigger long prison sentences under a federal law intended to get repeat offenders off the streets. The court was the scene of workers' protests. The court was the scene of workers' protests Saturday after the Senate voted to confirm Kavanaugh, but only about 20 protesters showed up Tuesday. They chanted on the side, on the back side of the building, where the justices drive into the parking garage, moved to the front for a brief demonstration, and left. Supreme Court police were prepared for much larger crowds and the possibility that protesters might try to interrupt the courtroom proceedings. Waiting spectators were warned that any outburst inside the courtroom can be punished as a federal offense. But the two hours of oral, oral arguments went ahead in the, normal, in the normal manner. Hey, whichever protesting group that decided not to go out and protest today during, 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 during their first argument, thank you. 
I guess you guys have probably realized that when those images of you guys protesting is out there, I, I get it. It is your constitutional right to protest. Look at what happened to Colin Kaepernick. You know what I mean? It is your it is your First Amendment rights. I mean, you can do it all you want. But when it comes to the powers that be and these Republicans in office right now, so I tell you, that damn right goes out the window. The only people who can protest how they want is Tea Partiers and Neo-Nazis and Charlottesville, Virginia. They're the only ones who can do what they want and get away with it. Because there are fine people on both sides of the on both sides, right? There are more fine people who's on the right side than it is on the left side, you know what I mean? I'm just saying, yeah. Thank you for not going out there and protest, because those images were just gonna be used in campaign ads anyway. You know. Chief Justice John Roberts offered the user greeting for a new justice, welcoming him, wishing him a long and happy career in our common calling. Kavanaugh chatted with Justice Elena Kagan, who sits next to him on the bench. Kavanaugh asked about a dozen questions during arguments on the two cases, both involving challenges to the way states interpret the Armed Career Criminal Act. During the during the day's first argument, testing whether Florida's definition is so broad that it counts virtually every post nurture as a violent robbery. Justice Sonia Sotomayor asked if the state went too far in defining what accounts what it counts as a violent robbery. Is a pinch an ordinary pinch? Let's not talk about an extraordinary pulling of the ears that the parents might sometimes do. Let's talk about just a pinch. Is that sufficient force? She asked. At that point, she illustrated by her points by pinching Justice Neil Gorsuch. You should try and make sure he ain't a vampire, huh? At her right, so laughter in, is in the courtroom. Earlier Tuesday, the Supreme Court declined to review an environmental ruling written by Kavanaugh in his former role as an uh, appeals court judge. The justices left in place Kavanaugh's August 27 opinion that struck down an Obama-era Environmental Protection Agency rule. That rule was intended to limit the release of a class of chemicals that contribute to global warming. So the new Supreme Court justice, when he was in the appeals court, struck down, struck down an, an Obama-era EPA rule that says that they try to limit how much chemicals are released into, into, into the atmosphere. I told you America was great when Obama was president. You know what I mean? <laughs> Kavanaugh wrote that the EPA lacks the authority to regulate the chemicals under a part of the Clean Air Act that addresses ozone depleting chemicals. Kavanaugh returns to the courtroom Wednesday for the other two cases to be heard this week involving detention of illegal immigrants and liability for asbestos injuries in the United Na in the US Navy. Oh man, I don't even have seats pen to on here. I would have loved to have had that, had that damn, had that damn, uh, had, had, had the proceedings in the background. Oh, man. Okay, this was an awesome read from 2015, right? And, and if you don't know, the Weather Channel just, re just, just released the names from A to Z of what names they're going to give to the, to to winter storms this coming winter season. And by the way, if you don't know, Byron Allen, the black entrepreneur, owns the Weather Channel now. Congratulations, brother. I know I've said it already, but still, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just saying, man, that is just awesome. This was a, uh, an article from the Washington Post. It was written by Crystal Brent Zook on August the 17th of 2015, and it is titled, Blacks own just 10 United States television stations. Here's why. Consolidation and historic discrimination are pushing minority owners out. This month, a federal district court judge in California threw out media, media entrepreneur Byron Allen's $20, million, $20 billion lawsuit against Comcast and Time Warner Cable. 
The suit accuses the cable giants of discriminating against black-owned media companies by creating and reserving just a few spaces for their channels at the back of the bus. The judge disagreed, dismissing the 71-page lawsuit in a snappy three-page decision. But just because this particular case fell flat doesn't mean But just because this particular case fell flat doesn't mean minority exclusion from broadcast and cable ownership isn't a problem. It is a big one. Minority owners are burdened by the legacy of slavery. When the United States government first started giving away our airwaves in the 1930s, they were distributed exclusively to white male owners. It, it mostly stayed that way until the 1970s, so 40 years of that. White male owners were the ones owning, you know. It mostly stayed out this way until, until the 1970s when the FCC tried to remedy the problem by implementing a, quote, minority ownership policy. This measure offered tax incentives to people seeking to sell stations to minority owners. The policy worked. Within 10 years of its passage, the country went from one black-owned television station to 10. Over its total 17-year existence, minority ownership increased fivefold, but it wasn't struck down. But it was struck down by the newly elected Republican Congress in 1995. Bill Clinton was president. They had a Democratic president, but you know, it was a Republican Congress. You know what I mean? That's why when when black folks say they vote, that means when black folks talk about they vote, they vote every four years. No. The most important elections are the ones that you don't vote for the president in. Like, come on, y'all, like, you know. But it was struck down by the newly elected Republican.